a lot of the people that were trying to adopt Agile weren't trying to adopt Agile so much from the perspective of inspecting and adapting and changing. What they were trying to do is to try to drive collaboration, visibility, transparency, teamwork, um, you know, within existing kind of plan driven ecosystems. And so, so as I got out and I started to talk to more people and I wasn't kind of in the, the agile echo chamber, I was, I was, you know, realizing that the motivations across the industry were all over the place. And what was interesting about it is that you could, you could use agile to achieve a lot of different kinds of goals. And so if you wanted to inspect and adapt and learn from your customers and try to figure out what things they wanted to buy. Agile was a, was a way that you could do that, right? And then, but if you also wanted to be more plan driven and you wanted to drive transparency and to be able to unambiguously measure progress against a known backlog, you could use Agile for that as well. So 12 years ago, we did a post on the Leading Agile blog called the top 12 reasons why companies um, adopt Agile. And, you know, trying to put myself in the headspace of, of where I was at when I wrote that post. One of the big things that I've been talking about for a long time, this is probably right when Leading Agile first got spun up. And one of the things that we were trying to do is, you know, so many people are trying to adopt Agile for the sake of adopting Agile. And, and, and it's not that there wasn't like a business reason, right? I mean, there was this notional idea that something was broken in the organization. Maybe we weren't delivering with predictability or we were doing big batch planning and things were changing or we're delivering really late or we're, we're not on time, right? That kind of a thing. And so there's like this notional idea that, you know, waterfall wasn't working and, and agile was going to be a better way. Um, you know, back in my version one days, one of the things that I used to, I used to find myself on the phone with people that had, had bought the version one tool all the time and they were, they were trying to adopt agile. And, you know, I was probably rather naive, you know, 14, 15 years ago, you know, I, I kind of got into this mindset, like a lot of people where, you know, agile was all about inspecting and adapting and trying to figure out what's the right thing to build. And what I learned pretty quickly is that a lot of the people that were trying to adopt Agile weren't trying to adopt Agile so much from the perspective of inspecting and adapting and changing. What they were trying to do is to try to drive collaboration, visibility, transparency, teamwork, um, you know, within existing kind of plan driven ecosystems. And so. So as I got out and I started to talk to more people and I wasn't kind of in the, the agile echo chamber, I was, I was, you know, realizing that the motivations across the industry were all over the place. And what was interesting about it is that you could, you could use agile to achieve a lot of different kinds of goals. And so if you wanted to inspect and adapt and learn from your customers and try to figure out what things they wanted to buy, Agile was a, was a way that you could do that, right? And then, but if you also wanted to be more plan driven and you wanted to drive transparency and to be able to unambiguously measure progress against the known backlog, you could use Agile for that as well. So what we thought we'd do in this particular, you know, video series is go through the, the 12 things that I wrote about, um, you know, 12 years ago and the, the, the reasons why companies were adopting Agile. And let's see if they're still applicable today. Let's see if it's, um, if it's something that's still worth being part of the conversation. I will tell you as a little bit of a preview, um, when, when we pulled the blog post up and I took a look at it, it is kind of amazing that, you know, that things don't change all that heck of a lot. And so if you go back to like the first thing was that I put on that list was faster time to market. And so like, like, what does that mean? So, you know, a lot of times people think that agile is, um, you know, enables you to move faster. And, it, and in some ways it does, but I would suggest that the main, um, the main benefit or the main mechanism by which uh, agile allows us to achieve faster time to market is by breaking big things up into smaller pieces. 
And then you're able to, to take those smaller pieces and you're able to bring those smaller pieces to market sooner. And you're able to get not only feedback from how customers are actually using the software that you've brought to market, but you're also able to start deriving value from it. So like theoretically, you know, you should be able to put stuff in market and customers are buying it and they're using it and they're getting value from it. And one of the things you find, right, if you're prioritizing the work appropriately and you're getting the most valuable things out early, you get this secondary effect of you might find yourself where you get through 30 or 40 percent of the product backlog and you realize that it's actually sufficient and you're ready to go on to the next thing. And so there's nothing in Agile that that inherently makes the work go faster. I mean, you could argue that having test coverage and doing test driven development and pair programming and you know, working together as a team and disambiguating backlogs. I mean, all that stuff absolutely drives efficiency. But, and, but the, the, again, the main mechanism is being able to take really large projects and then to put them into market in smaller chunks and then to not only get feedback, to also learn when you've built enough and you know, the, there's a diminishing return on going through the rest of the backlog. So the second piece that I wrote about, uh, kind of closely related to the first piece, was this idea of early return on investment. And so you know, when, I was, uh, when I was spinning up Leading Agile or when I was doing coaching before Leading Agile started 12 years ago, you know, one of the, object, or the objections that I would get to doing Agile is that a lot of times the developers didn't feel like it was the most efficient way to build software. Like if they could just be heads down, write the software in layers, write, um, you, know, you know, frameworks before they started writing features, you know, conceptually, it felt like the most efficient way, the most conceptually whole way um, to build products. But, you know, as we, we kind of know, I think this is kind of old news is that, is that when we, when we conceptualize and we build without getting customer feedback, you know, one of the challenges is we really risk building the wrong product or we risk building defects into the product as we go. And, you know, whether it be, you know, intrinsic, extrinsic quality, maybe it's not suitable to purpose, all those kinds of things. And so one of the things that Agile allows us to do is the, you know, the ability to focus on working tested product all the time, working tested product from the customer's perspective. And so when we build software that way, what it enables us, what it allows us to be able to do is to put that software in the hands of the customer early. And, and by them having that software early, it enables us to actually charge for it. So, so rather than, you know, if we have a three year long project and we're able to break it into 12 quarterly releases, or maybe we're even able to break those releases into two week deployments, or, you know, if we're really good, able to get into a continuous deployment model, you know, we're able to get the product in front of the customer faster. So again, the idea is that we can get feedback, but we can also start charging money for it. So the ideas of um, faster time to market and um, earlier time investment are, are really um, closely related in this conversation. The third piece, um, you know, it's interesting as I, as I start to go through these things, the third piece is, is really related as well, right? The ability to get feedback from customers. So one of the big drivers um, for, for adopting Agile that we'll get is, um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time building the wrong product or we spend a lot of time building features that our customers aren't actually going to use. So by breaking the product up into bite-sized chunks that customers can actually use and interact with, then we are able to be in a situation where because we have their feedback, we're able to um, you know, inspect and adapt, and adapt our way into building software that's, that's actually usable. Um, you know, it, it's fascinating because you know, historically, you know, we've been running Leading Agile for about 12 years. I was in the Agile world for probably five years before that. And I was always building other people's products. 
And when we started leading Agile about six or seven years ago, we, uh, or I guess we started 12 years ago, but we, we started to build a dev team about seven or eight years ago. And we're working on an internal product called Navigator that's been in development um, for, you know, for a while now. And we use it to run our engagements. We use it to, to do our um, you know, staffing allocations and our portfolio management and metrics and assessments with the clients that we're working with. And so what's been fascinating about you know, spending my own money um, to build a product for my own company you know, one of the things that I realized is that sometimes at the beginning of a project, you, you don't really even know exactly what is the most important thing to build. So you have this notional idea of where you want to take the product, but by actually building the product, then you actually learn about what's possible. You learn about how it's going to be used, and then you're actually able to branch and inspect and adapt. And I know for a lot of folks that are building, you know, maybe they're building software to an RFP or a defined scope or they're doing something that's like mission critical that has to work in a certain way. I'm not really talking about those kinds of scenarios, but the idea where, you know, you're trying to build something that has value and market and you're not 100% sure what it is that you actually want to build Um you know, the ability to get feedback from people and how they're actually using the software um, is, is fairly powerful. Um, we've, we've saved ourselves from writing a lot of code that would never get used by being able to deploy software for clients and or our consultants and get feedback from them in real time. I was thinking about as I started to go through um, these, you know, we got through like what I guess the first four is, is really how closely related they are, right? So you think about the idea of faster time to market, you know, we break things up into small chunks so that we can um, put them in front of customers, get feedback, start charging money for them, right? That enables us to get an early return on investment, right? The idea of charging money for these things. And by virtue of having them in the hands of the customers and charging money for them, we're actually getting real feedback about what it is that the customers will actually use. And then because we have that feedback, we're able to build the right product. So if you think about it, right, the, the inherent mechanisms of team-based agility or enterprise agility, right, it, it just depends on what level of scale you're talking about, is this, this notion that we break big things up into small things and we release frequently. And, you know, just getting through the first four things on this list, we've gotten a, a tremendous amount of value just from, um, you know, the basic mechanisms of agility. And so, so it's, it's, it's not like, you know, we're implementing a, a different way of working necessarily depending upon what business goals we're trying to achieve, but depending upon the business goals we're trying to achieve, we can index on you know, certain things, right? So if we're, if we're really looking to inspect and adapt and figure out the market and make sure that we're building the right products and the right product fit, then, you know, we still use agile teams. We still build backlogs. We still produce working tests and software, but we, but we expect to maybe change that backlog or maybe we don't have the backlog as fully prepared. The fifth item in my list from 12 years ago was this idea of early risk reduction. So when we break things into small chunks, just like what we've been doing for early return on investment and making sure we're building the right product, we can, we can deploy things in market that, that help us validate that not only the customer will use it, but, but that it's technically feasible as well. I grew up in the rational unified process days. And uh, so I came out of Waterfall, went into RUP, um, moved into to, uh, incremental and iterative development, moved into Agile, that kind of a thing. And so I think of risk through the lens of like, are we building, is there, is there a solution that the customer will buy and pay for? Is that solution technically feasible? Can we deliver it on time? And then can we transition it um, to the customer to be able to use. So in, in, in the rough world from back in the day, you know, 20, 25 years ago, 
you know, we have this idea of inception, elaboration, construction, and transition. And so in inception, we were largely validating the business problem. In um, uh, inception, elaboration, we were making sure that the solution was technically feasible. Um, and then in construction, we're making sure that it can be built on time. And then in transition, we're making sure that we can deploy it to the customer. And so I think about risk in that way. We have to make sure that we are building something that the customer will actually pay for. And we have to believe that it's feasible within time and cost constraints. And so when we're, we're doing exercises on paper, we're doing all the analysis, we're doing all the design, and then we do all the build and all the test, we're not able to get that feedback and we're not able to get that risk reduction. So we build just enough software to put out in front of a customer and make sure that they'll actually use it. And then one of the things that um, I got introduced to me by Alistair Coburn, I don't know if this is, uh, it actually came from him originally or not, but the idea of a walking skeleton. The way I used to think about that is you take all of the architecturally significant elements of the solution and you validate them early. There was, um, one project I was working on in the financial services industry with a company called Check Free. It was kind of my last corporate job before I went out to go work for version one. And we had made a pretty large assumption in the design of this solution that, um, you know, I don't even remember, but mainframe system A was going to be able to talk to mainframe system B in a way that was, um, that was gonna facilitate this, this large scale transaction engine. And one of the things that I started asking about early on, because I'm really wired for this idea of mitigating risk, was why don't we validate that these two systems will actually talk to each other in the way that we expected? And uh, when we went to go validate that by building working types of software, we actually realized that it didn't work the way that the vendor had said that it would work. And so it ended up introducing like a six week delay into the project, but we knew that on day one. We didn't write a bunch of stuff for six weeks, figure out that um, all of that six weeks was throwaway, and then have to go and turn around and rewrite it and find a different solution. We were able to, to validate and reduce that risk early. And again, you know, by building working tested software, by actually exercising that walking skeleton, we're actually able to prove that rather than just do it as a thought exercise. So number six on my list was the idea of better quality. That's on my, my active list nowadays. So you, know, you think about like everything in the agile world that is um, just totally centered around the idea of quality, whether it be you know, developer practices like pair programming or test-driven development, the idea of um, continuously integrating, the idea of continuous deployment, um, if you have manual testers, the fact that those manual testers are interacting with live working software as it's getting built throughout the sprint. If we're doing integration testing across the, um, you know, the output of multiple teams, we can automate that. We can automate those integrations. We can do manual testing on those integrations. We can do performance and scalability testing as we go. Um, you know, one of the things that is, is, again, it's a hallmark of agility and it's a hallmark of um, you know what kind of contributes to speed right the idea that if the if the software is well architected intrinsic quality and uh, it's easy to know if you break it when you change it right test harnessing and validation and, and and such then we can move fearlessly through that code base because we we we, we aren't worried about, about breaking things because we know if it's broken all the time so what I think is cool with Agile is that just in the inherent um, practices of kind of the methodology, you know, just testing is just happening all the time. And so, and so the idea that teams are working together, teams are testing as they go, teams are looking at the software, they're meeting with the product owner on a continuous basis to make sure that we're building the right product, that the integrations are happening in real time. You know, one of the, the biggest challenges for more traditional software teams is when we're doing late integration, what we're doing is we're just piling up a tremendous amount of risk. And all of that risk just leads to 
um, you know, defects and, you know, problems that are really, really difficult to find after the fact. So just inherently in the Agile framework, uh, you know, you get the idea of uh, improved product quality. Um, you know, then I moved into this idea of culture and morale. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I think about a lot um, with Agile, and it tends to be a place a lot of people start with the idea of agility, is this idea that um, Agile will create a, a better culture within the organization. And when I first started talking about this idea, I mean, we're pretty notorious in leading Agile for, we don't think that um, Agile transformation is, is culture first. We really look at the systems, right? How you form teams, how you build backlogs, how you produce working tests of software, what the structure, the governance, the metrics, right? What practices enable agility? And through having the right systems and structures in place and then enabling those systems and structures with the right practices, you're able to achieve that culture. So you ask yourself, what is a culture of agility? Um, one of the things that I go back to quite a bit is Dan Pink's book, Drive, with the idea of autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And the idea that knowledge workers want to show up and they want to have autonomy over the work that they do. They want to demonstrate that they're good at doing that work. And they want that work to be tied to some greater purpose that they can actually believe in. Right? Dan Pink makes the case that that is kind of the, the hallmark of knowledge work. And when I first started exploring this idea, um, I was linking it to the idea of teams, backlogs, working tests, and software. The idea of an agile team, a team of six to eight people that are operating off of a really, really clean backlog that are able to produce a working test at increment at the end of every sprint, that's going to create a culture in that team of ownership. Think about the, the opposite of that. You have a team that doesn't have everything and everyone necessary to produce a working test and increment of software, and they're constantly waiting for things around them, right? That starts to be a culture of blame because people don't feel empowered to actually get their work done. In the absence of a really clean backlog, they don't have clarity around what it is that they're, they're being asked to build, right? Without the ability to produce a working test in increment, they don't have the ability to demonstrate mastery. And so when you don't have a complete cross-functional team, you don't have a backlog that you can work off of, you can't get to a definition of done at the end of the sprint, it's really difficult for that culture of ownership to emerge. And when we're dealing in much larger systems, right, um, one, of the, one of the challenges that you think about from a cultural perspective um, at scale is the idea of command and control leadership. Um, one of the reasons why leaders operate in a command and control way is because they, they don't have a reliable system that they can delegate into. Um, Agile at its core is the very definition of a reliable system that you can delegate into. You put backlog items in, you have a team with stable velocity, they can produce a working test increment, potentially shippable increment at the end of every sprint. Um, when you have a system like that, or you have a multi-team environment that's governed with Kanban or even some of the safe stuff, big room planning, where you start to get this culture where the system is trustworthy. And so when a leader can delegate into a trustworthy system, and get a reliable, predictable output on the backside, get a reliable, predictable outcome, you can start to change some of those cultural attributes. And so I'll just, I'll just suggest that the culture stuff, though, is a byproduct of a working agile system. It is a byproduct of having the right teaming strategies, the right backlog strategies, the ability to produce a working test increment, the ability to do small batch governance, the ability to measure and control in a way that's consistent with the values and principles of agility. And once you have those things in place, then the teams can take greater ownership, establish a culture of ownership, and the leaders can establish a culture of delegation where they know how to push work into the system because they're going to get a reliable outcome on the backside, they can allow the system to work without having to intervene in it as we go. So again, just want to reinforce the idea that culture is a byproduct of an agile system rather than like a, a first order concern, in my opinion, 
Um, you know, you, 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 don't, you don't create a culture by creating a culture. You create a culture by building a system and enable it with practices that, that actually result in the culture that you want to have. Um, the eighth item from my original list was the idea of efficiency. And if you think about efficiency, right, um, it's probably the easiest thing when you want to counterpoint the efficiency of an agile team, it's, it's, it's probably worth counterpointing that to the lack of efficiency in a more traditional waterfall team. The first thing that, that I, would, I would probably highlight is that there is a gigantic conceptual shift when it comes to the idea of efficiency with um, Agile between more traditional mechanisms. Uh, Agile really leverages the idea of throughput accounting. We are going to organize the efficiency of the system to make sure that that work is flowing through the system, that working test of software is coming out of the system on regular intervals. A more traditional waterfall functionally siloed organization, its idea of efficiency is about maximizing the productivity of the individual, maximizing the amount of hours that that person is working, making sure that that person is working on the things that are the, the most closely aligned with their skill set. And so efficiency in a, in a more waterfall world is really about making sure that we have the right people assigned to the right work at the right time to make sure that we're maximizing their utilization and that we're optimizing for their ability to apply their skill set into the problem. What Agile very specifically does is it says, okay, look, um, we don't want to optimize for the production capacity of the individual. What we want to do is we want to maximize for the throughput of the cross-functional team. And that means to some degree we might sub-optimize the efficiency of the individual. We might sub-optimize the, their ability to apply their skill set at the right place in the right time because we want those individuals to be instantly available to the team so that there is less weight, there's less waste, there's less communication latency, there's less misunderstanding, there's less likelihood that we're gonna build the wrong product or that we're gonna build a product that's not tested and validated. And so this notion of efficiency shifts from this cost accounting mode to more of a throughput accounting mode. And what we're going to optimize for is making sure that we can get working tested product to market as fast as we can, rather than making sure that each individual in the system is operating at its highest level of productivity. The ninth element that I talked about was the idea of customer satisfaction. The thing with customer satisfaction is that, is that when, when we're dealing in a more traditional waterfall world and we're doing big upfront designs and we're doing big plans, um, one of the things we inherently know is that, is that the customers are going to know the least about what they want at the beginning of the project. We also know that over time, the markets and the customers are going to change. We also know that over time, their understanding of the product is going to change. And so what we wanna do is we wanna create systems that are resilient to change because in order to drive customer satisfaction, we need to be able to take feedback as we go. Now, let's allow that, that in some contexts, right, there's certain things in, you know, um, you know, hardware production and in, you know, things like airplanes or, you know, certain defense contracting kinds of things, automobiles, where there is a certain level of the software has to do a certain set of stuff. That's true, right? And so as long as we can get that software to work in its context, on time, you know, within scope, on budget, right, those kinds of things, that is going to drive a certain level of customer satisfaction. There's a different kind of customer satisfaction that really gets into this idea of suitable to purpose. 
right? And so if we're building something where we have concerns as to whether it's suitable to purpose, we want to engage the customer as we go. We want to deliver in small batches. We want to get their feedback as they interact with the software and making sure that we're going to build something that, that they're actually going to use on the backside. So customer satisfaction is not only driven by things like on time, on cost, on budget, but it's also driven by the idea that we have the opportunity to collaborate with that customer in real time to be able to take their feedback and, and have the ability to adjust the product to make sure that it's suitable to purpose. As, as, as we go. Um, very closely related, this was my 10th bullet point, was the idea of alignment. Making sure that, that everybody in the organization is aligned on the objectives that we are, are seeking to achieve. Um, you know, one of the things that, that's really interesting, and I, and I think this is probably true in most human endeavors, we started off talking about the idea of agile, um, we started talking about the idea of the business value of Agile. And, and sometimes I think we have this idea that Agile is going to solve a class of problems. And then, you know, so we get to the business of implementing Agile and it almost becomes a, a means unto itself, right? It becomes, it becomes the thing that we're doing. Um, one of the things I learned in my late 20s, um, I, I did a bunch of Lotus Notes administration of all things, right, back in the day. Um, I actually had the title of Lotus Notes Architect, right? And for anybody who uh, doesn't remember Lotus Notes, it was kind of a, an email, an early email system. It had some um, pretty interesting kind of work group database things that you could, that you could build. Um, it caused actually a, a pretty significant proliferation of um, lots of little databases and apps that I think actually caused IT groups a lot of problems in the long run. But it was a, it was a really interesting, um, you, know, you know, thing to do. And one time we had this initiative that we were doing because we, were, we wanted more resiliency in our email system. So we were looking to do failover and we were looking to do redundancy and hot swaps and all these kinds of interesting things. And so um, this new version of Lotus Notes had the ability to accommodate that, but we needed to upgrade the servers in order to be able to do it. So we were going to upgrade the servers and we we're going to install the new software. And we we're going to configure it with these new features so that the executives in our company could take advantage of all of this, um, you know, this dynamic interplay, no downtime, right? All those kinds of things. And so one of the things that um, everybody I was working with would say is they started calling it the server upgrade project. And what I thought was fascinating is that the server upgrades were a means to an end. The project was basically like a zero downtime initiative. But we, were, we kind of started to assume that zero downtime was the underlying concern. And we started to talk about the work through the lens of the server upgrade. Well, what happens over time is that you start to call it the server upgrade project long enough. And you start to think that the objective is to upgrade the servers. And, you know, one of the things that I think is really cool about Agile is that we're constantly focused on the business problems we're trying to solve. And because we're doing things in small batches and because we're putting value in the hands of users in an ongoing way, um, it allows the, the product development teams and their business stakeholders to stay in continuous alignment. We're not building servers for the sake of building servers. We're building servers for the sake of creating this capability. We are, we are introducing Agile for not because we want everybody to do Scrum, but because we are seeking to get product into market faster. If we're not getting product into market faster, then you know, whatever we're doing with Agile isn't working. You know, the products that we're building with Agile, we want to make sure that we are in alignment with our customers as we go, right? So especially if like somebody's paying us to do a particular project, you know, we have this idea that, that they've paid for a certain outcome. And we want to make sure that the teams are not focused on doing requirements documents and designs and all these things, but they're actually you know, engaging with the customer and making sure that the things that they're building are going to be the things that are going to be able to move that customer forward and actually solve their business problems. 
So the ability to stay in alignment with ourselves, with the other parts of the organization, with our customers is, is really kind of a huge, um, yeah, just kind of a, a huge benefit of, of adopting Agile. Um, the last two things that, that I had on my list were, um, are almost counterpointed to each other, right? Um, 11 was the idea of emergent outcomes, and the 12th was the idea of predictable outcomes. So it's really fascinating thinking 12 years ago, because we have this language that's up on our website, you guys hear me talk about it all the time, of, we call it four quadrants of leading agile compass where we start with the idea of predictability and adaptability. Um, and companies want to be able to make and meet commitments, but they also want to be able to respond to change. They want to be able to build the software that they said they were going to build, but they also want to be able to respond to emerging requirements as they go. And so concepts like predictability and emergence, they, they kind of compete with each other a little bit because the more that we strive for predictability, the harder it is to change. The more that we try to deliver against a fixed scope, the harder it is to be able to respond to the markets and uh, the nuances of what we're learning by delivering working tests of software. And so, and so what I think is fascinating is that Agile can be used to accommodate both. Right? So just at the team level, um, complete cross-functional teams operating off of a well-defined backlog, able to produce a working test and increment at the end of every sprint. If you sat down and you built, let's say, a quarter or two quarters worth of backlog, feature level backlog, epic level backlog, user story level backlog, and, and that team was working collaboratively against that backlog, you would absolutely 100% drive up your ability to deliver predictably against that backlog. You know, because, you know, we have this idea of invest, right? Uh, independent, negotiable, valuable, estimatable, small, and testable. We're operating off of a known backlog, but we're pivoting and making changes within the context of that backlog to optimize our chances of being successful and run out of time and money. Right? So we have a known backlog. We inspect and adapt our way to deliver predictable and reliable results. But the very same mechanisms that allow us to do that predictable inspect and adapt and to, to converge on the outcomes that we're trying to achieve are those very same mechanisms that allow us to produce emergent outcomes. So as we're building a little bit of software against that known backlog, if we learn something new, we can make very intentional decisions about what to pull out and what to add in to make sure that we're building the right product that's going to fit in market that people are going to use. So it's, it's interesting. So the mechanisms that allow for predictability are the very same mechanisms that allow for emergent outcomes. It all just depends upon how you deploy and what mindset you bring to those mechanisms and practices and, and how you think about responding to change. One of the things that we talk about a lot in the Leading Agile Change Management methodology and our transformation um, strategy and approach is that often what you do is like the first base camp, right? The first step in our customer journey is to get predictable because most organizations are really striving for predictability and they want to use Agile to make and meet commitments. Um, it's almost impossible to walk into any organization and just say, hey, we're just gonna do pure emergent outcomes. Like almost everybody wants to know, uh, you know what teams I'm gonna deploy, what's the scope I'm gonna do, when am I gonna be in market, right? All those kinds of things. And so you can use Agile in the early stages to drive that predictability, that early return on investment, that making sure that we're making money when we say we're gonna make money. But because those mechanisms also give us the option to change, as the business starts to learn and trust the mechanisms of Agile, then they can start exploiting those capabilities for more emergent outcomes. Said another way, right? Again, small team Agile. I'm operating off of a known backlog. I have my release set. My user stories are written in small batches so that I can deliver a handful of them through the course of a sprint. 
my my feature my features are written so that I can have multiple features being delivered delivered within a, re, a release. Because my teams are operating with stable velocity, because I'm using great testing practices, because I'm doing continuous integration and continuous deployment, because I'm working side by side with my customers, I optimize my chances of being able to make and meet commitments and to deliver what I say I'm going to do and to make sure that I'm bringing the right product to market. But again, those mechanisms that allow us to be predictable are the same mechanisms that allow us to change our mind. So in an early stage transformation, you're doing the same thing, but you're deploying it in a way that increases predictability. As the business begins to trust the mechanisms of agility, then it starts to learn how it can inspect and adapt. And when it starts to see the power of being able to change its mind and being able to respond to market, then what happens is you start to create the conditions where the business is more open to change. So I find this blog post really fascinating. You know, 12 years later, the top 12 things. Um, most always I talk about now are, are six that I think are, are pretty much represented in this list, right? The idea of predictability, quality, early return on investment, cost savings. That's really kind of efficiency sometimes. So I think about cost savings. Um, lots of organizations have people deployed into the wrong seat. So, so often it's not a matter of lowering headcount or reducing costs, but it's about deploying the, the people in the organization into things that are going to yield the most value for the organization. So predictability, quality, early return investment, cost savings, innovation, right? The ability to inspect and adapt and create emergent outcomes. And then the idea of product fit, making sure that we're building the right product. And then, you know, one of the things that's kind of emerged over the last couple of years really gets into the space of, um, I'm going to say like employee satisfaction in a way and making sure that the employees are engaged in, in the things that we're doing. Because, you know, most young people, most professionals nowadays don't want to work in a gigantic um, rigid waterfall environment where they don't have the ability to collaborate with each other and they, you know, you know, again, long lead times, long deployment cycles, gigantic bug lists and things like that. Most people don't want to work in that kind of a world. So there's really kind of a seventh emerging that is really around employee satisfaction that we're starting to see. It's almost like being able to have a, a healthy, agile ecosystem is becoming a little bit of like table stakes for attracting and retaining the best talent. So, so that's really it. That's probably my update to the top 12. Like I said, you know, most of the time we focus on the six, predictability, quality, a return investment, cost savings, innovation, product fit, with this idea of employee satisfaction, employee engagement, net promoter scores on the company, that kind of a thing, um, being kind of a, a fast follow behind that. But um, I would say over the last 12 years, that list has held up actually pretty well. I don't think um, there's been a ton of movement or a ton of change. Um, and I think it's a pretty solid list.